everybody. Welcome, welcome to Side Business School, those of you who are not uh, members of the business school. Um, I know we have people here from the wider university and some guests of our MBA and the second MBA students, and also um, some members of the press here with us today. So I'd just like to say that um, usually when we are together as a class, we operate on Chatham House rules and we can say, anything about each other's companies and each other's departments. Uh, but this is a, a public lecture, so we welcome you all, but um, do bear that in mind. Um, I'm delighted today that uh, one of my students, Lucia Volgner, who works for the chairman of Credit Suisse, was kind enough to, uh, to invite Mr. Rona to come and speak here today. And I think it's a testament to uh, the dedication and the loyalty of our executive MBA students that they bring the richness uh, and the expertise from their own organisations to this business school. So, Lucia, thank you very much. I'm delighted that you could do this for us. We're very grateful. Um, Louis Rona is a very special guest and also something of a Renaissance man in his background. He has a very distinguished career, first as a lawyer, but then as a CEO for uh, a big media company in Germany, and now, of course, as chairman of Credit Suisse. So his experience spans many industries and many levels of organizations and different roles. Um, and I'm particularly looking forward to hearing how he has reflected on the experience he's gained uh, with us this afternoon. And I'm very pleased that uh, my colleague Mark, Mark Ventresca, who many of you know as a member of faculty, is going to lead the conversation. Mark, as you know, is a fellow in strategy and teaches innovation and entrepreneurship, and also has an interest in leadership. So um, it's a great opportunity to have uh, a conversation that sparks lots of the interest mm -hmm. that Mark has in, in his research as well. So, uh, Mark, I'll hand over to you, and Mr. Rowan, welcome. It's a uh, great pleasure to have you. Kathy, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear us? First of all, just, yeah, okay, good. So thank you very much, everyone. I want to offer a special, also a welcome to Urs Rona for joining us. He's come a long way, very early today. Very kind of him to make this stop to really share with us the insights of his uh, career and especially his current challenges and insights about banking and uh, transformation and innovation in the banking industry. I think what we're going to do is I'm going to make a brief uh, introduction of the, some ideas and issues. We're then going to engage in a bit of back and forth, and then we'll hopefully wrap up by around 6.05 to open up to questions and comments as we go along. So there's a mercifully short time when we're talking at you and a longer time when you can talk with us. How's that? So we'll, we'll see how we go. And I think ours has been incredibly gracious. We're also going to stand here iteratively, iteratively as we go along. Um, so. Uh, again, really want to thank you for, for taking time and also bringing the kind of experience of Credit Suisse. Many of you know Credit Suisse is an extremely distinguished uh, firm, a lot, uh, lot of propriety over time, a lot of innovation, an interesting leader in a global industry and an interesting player in a changing global interest industry. And so part of the challenge of this conversation is to say it has become commonplace to talk about disruption. I think in every industry, incumbents are looking sideways and backwards and forwards trying to understand what does it mean to be an incumbent in an industry that is potentially at risk of disruption. I want to say two minutes about disruption. Some of you will know this argument already. Um, I want to then use that to really open up the set of issues that Urs is going to share with us. So disruption, I think, so the positive story here is that dis disruption has become a really common word for many of us in business schools and in industry and elsewhere. The general argument there is that uh, incumbent firms often become successful and become, it becomes difficult for them to notice transformations, innovations, and changes that potentially could change the core uh, dimensions of competition or could change the basis of their advantage or could in fact change the industry or annihilate the industry in many cases. That argument comes from pioneering work by many people, many people associated with the name of Clay Christensen and others who argued an interesting argument that many, many uh, firms who have current market position, current incumbency value, uh, do well, do interesting products and services, innovate along the way. But another firm, a challenger firm, comes along that does what they do but not as well. So that challenger may do something that is akin to what the incumbent offers, but they do it less well, less efficiently, less reliably, 
with whatever set of uh, concerns that make it not competitive. And the, 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 the challenge here, the, the kind of issue here, is that many incumbents then fail to notice that. They fail to notice a challenger which doesn't really seem to pose a threat or doesn't really seem to be competitive. And then the kind of formal argument, it goes like this. Over time, those challengers freed from the expectations or the assumptions of the incumbent industry or the leader in the industry actually not only do what that leader does well enough, good enough, but they do something different. They do something that offers different kinds of value, creates different kinds of services or offerings. And over time, whether that's a year or five years or 10 years or 50 years, actually beat the incumbent, not at its own game, but at a different game that the incumbent didn't notice, right? So the, the kind of core argument of disruption that you know is status quo, things are how they are. The challenger comes along, doesn't do things as well, isn't noticed, over time iterates, gets better, and eventually displaces the incumbent, not only the firm, but potentially the underlying technology or value system. Um, and that's, uh, as, as we all know, that's an argument being made about banking today, and that's going to be the topic of our conversation. Two quick other observations that I would say here, both at Said at Oxford and also generally. One is that that word disruption, I think, is overused, and I think its commonness has driven out a lot of analytic precision. And so I want to challenge you today to think with us, to think with Urs and me about what disruption actually might mean in the banking industry. What does that mean in the global banking industry? And specifically, I want us to really think very concretely and granularly about what would disruption look like at different parts of the value system? What forms would that take? How would we notice that? So I really want to think, <coughs> excuse me, I really want to think not only about disruption, but what are, how do firms recognize opportunity? What does transformation look like? In this sense, I'm going to push us to think not about disruption, capital D, the big D, but instead to really understand a whole cascade of smaller innovations whoops, that are often distal to the industry incumbent. They may be occurring in technologies or value offerings or services offerings that are actually currently distant from the business model or the design of an incumbent firm. And that's the, that's the interesting question. And this is, what I think, what Urs has a lot of insights on. What is it the banking faces today in those distal, potentially transformative activities? What is it the banking needs to notice? How is kind of incumbent banking going to do that? And I think that's a challenge that is, is common in many industries, but particularly highlighted in, uh, in banking. I don't want to give away a lot of the insights we're going to hear, but I think I, my encouragement to you is to begin to think very groundedly in very pragmatic terms. What's the existing value offering? What's the business model? What's the way that value is currently created? Not only at the outcome, but all along a complex uh, services offering development and begin to think in those kind of more granular terms as we listen to ours. So please come join me and hold forth. Thank you, Mark. I think you have really teed it up very nicely. Um, <coughs> let me say a couple of words. First, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here. Uh, in fact, it's really an honor for me to be here to discuss uh, innovation and disruption with you um, today. And then maybe to tee it up from my side, let me say a couple of things about our industry and uh, how I see it and uh, where I see the challenges uh, coming from. And I also see what uh, fintech companies or, or these so-called disruptive companies actually do to our industry or may be doing to our industry. First of all, I would say, contrary to many other industries where we have seen really huge disruptions and big companies going away, I mean, uh, Nokia, uh, Kodak, maybe just two examples, um, but you have to have seen industries that have completely changed their business model, had to change their business model completely and have basically disappeared. New people came, have come in and have taken over that business completely. In the financial services industry up until now, you have not really seen that uh, to that extent, which is surprising, right? It's surprising because banks normally, they employ a lot of technology people. I mean, if you take Credit Suisse as an example, we have maybe 10,000 people in IT and the industry has been quite good. Some people may, may say not even good for their own sake or their own good uh, in, in innovating products, inventing new products. But that's not what I'm talking about. I mean, when, I, when you look as to when we talk about disruption now in today's, clients' behavior have changed, clients' expectations have changed, and the way you look at businesses and the way you look at products has changed too. This is due to a number of factors. One is transparency. The other one is comparability. Hmm. Um, those are two things which, in a way, were a bit counter against many of the older models in banking, I would say. And interestingly enough, 
this is not where we have seen a fundamental change resulting from, from these things um, uh, to the business model of banks uh, in, in general. And I will focus now a bit more today on, on the wealth management piece than on the wholesale banking because it's a bit easier for me to actually, to actually do it uh, because uh, it's core and it, you can explain some of the things that I, I think are relevant when you look at disruption uh, uh, easier than otherwise. What we have seen, and you see that now, you can read it in the, in the newspaper every day, uh, there are fintech companies that you know, are, have started to address parts of the value chain of what banks have been doing, be it in terms of lending, lending club, crowdfunding up, fund, funding applications, be it in the area of, uh, of risk management, for instance, completely new ways as to how you can risk manage, manage your portfolios or your books at, I would say, uh, much uh, less uh, uh, costs, at a much uh, reduced costs. And you see it also in the area of the wealth management or private banking business, where basically you have, you have model portfolios, you can track other investors, and you get a lot of these things you get for free. But when, what you can see is in most of those fintech companies, they take one slice out of the value chain. Payments, for instance, is one good example. In fairness, has largely gone away from banks. It's done differently. Um, and what you, when you think about it, you have to say, well, what, what's the end game really? Now, I would say what we see, what will be, will, will be seeing it, uh, to, to happen is because of that and because certain parts of the value chain can be produced much cheaper, you will see that generally the cost base of banks, of traditional banks, is under heavy pressure. And this is exactly what you're seeing right now. Uh, that's why all the banks have to do a lot on costs. We did a lot on, co on costs. So far, we took out about four and a half billion of our annual running costs in the last, uh, uh, last three years as a result of that. On the other hand, it's also an opportunity, obviously, for banks to, to go into, into, uh, uh, into looking at your technology costs in, in doing certain things cheaper, faster, better. That's, that's one aspect of it. The other one is the transparency piece. Um, transparency and comparability means clients will judge your services much more critical than before, because they can. Um, and at some point you will, and that's when I look into the future, and that's where my, I would say my thinking started about, about disruption, about changing also the business model is in a world where basically a couple of years from now almost everything will be transparent. Uh, and you will get a lot of information that typically has been provided by banks in the context of advisory services and others, others for free. The ultimate question for your, for, uh, that you have to ask yourself is why would the client pay you 80 or 100 basis points for your advice mm -hmm. if he gets 80% of that for free? So what he basically does, it focuses your thinking on what is ultimately banking services, what's, what's the service, the add-on you provide, and there you very quickly come to the question of banking is more than just individual parts of a value chain. Advice is more than that. Advice is, mm. has to do with judgment. It has to do with being able to absorb a lot of information and take the right conclusions out of it. For that, a lot of the applications that fintech companies provide, be it through big data, algorithms and others, can be very helpful because you may know certain things better. Um, but in the end, it will always come down to making judgment calls, the taking decisions as to what you want to do. And therefore, I mean, I have a couple of, of theses uh, in, in terms of disruption. Is I think fintech newcomers probably for our industry do at the moment more construction than disruption. There may be fields where some parts go away, like payments or so, but generally they provide a service that the incumbents can also use. And a lot of the back office disruption, I would, I would suggest basically uh, benefits the incumbents if they are if they are fast enough to team up with people in in those space and actually take the right conclusions out of it namely try to drive down their cost base because inevitably their gross margins will go down have been going down and will continue to go down uh, and thereby if you do that right you may keep up your your net margins uh, I think most of the of the fintech uh, innovators will have a hard time actually being long-term successful because what they need, because the way the system works, so their model works, is basically they can produce something cheaper, but they need a lot of growth to actually scale up. 
And I'm not sure that this, uh, in, 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 in all the cases or many of the cases, will be possible to do that fast enough in order to have a valuable business case uh, going forward. The big chance for mo mo many of those companies, and that's what you currently are seeing, is that they team up with larger banks, that, but be it by way of joint ventures, that they are being taken over. Um, and that's uh, something which I think prudent incumbents should be doing. Yeah. But ultimately, I would say ultimately, the winning approach, in my opinion, is that you, know, you, you are able to provide an integrated financial service even in the future. And there the big, quest, the big, the big topic would be is what do you have to change to be, to be and remain attractive for your customers? And that will be different because one thing, one big topic in, in, the, whole, in the whole sphere, I would say, is, is the element of trust. Bank, in banking, banking relationships are relationships of trust mm -hmm. between the client and the bank. You give your money to your bank because you think you will get it back, uh, hopefully with interest uh, and, and, uh, uh, or, or more, when, when you want it and you can be trusted that the bank is around when you need it, doesn't, doesn't do stupid things with your money, etc. The trust element, and that's a bit counterintuitive initially, will remain as important or maybe even more important in, in a digitized world, world than before. Before you had this 30-year-old relationship, relationship with your bankers, with the relationship manager, you had dinner or lunch with him twice or three times a year, he showed you the portfolio, you discussed things, you could call him up. In the digitized world, it's much more important that you have that too, that you feel comfortable and trustworthy. And that, I think, is the biggest chance for incumbents if they get it right, if they have the right applications to basically to basically provide the services that clients want, but on the other hand are able to, to sort of create that band of trust with the future clients. Mm. And the future clients are not only you, but maybe your kids. Mm. They will not go to banks. They will do it via their iPads. And this is not just at the retail segment of our payments. You will do it throughout the entire value chain. You will do it within the high net worth space and in the ultra high net worth space. And that's one of the reasons why at Credit Suisse what we have done uh, why I project Future Lab, we have basically started to think about as to how the future customer will react, what he will want, and what that does to our current way of operating the business. And one of the projects that grew out of that is the creation of a digital private bank for the higher segment. We are beta testing it at the moment as we speak in Asia, and where we believe we have a comprehensive offering to the clients where they can do a lot of things themselves. They can even probably team up or interact with other people, um, uh, other clients, if they so want. Um, they get access to, to top-notch research, but they also have the possibility in a very easy way to contact uh, to, to, uh, the, the relationship manager, to speak to risk people, to speak to specialists and things. That, I think, is one of the ways as to how you, you can address the overall, the overall thing. But disruption in banking will come. And my claim always is internally, and you know, initially when I, when I brought this up, uh, this was not that everybody just jumped on the idea and said, well, it's great, let's do that, is it will change fundamentally the way banks operate. The requirements for relationship managers will significantly change. You may need, to some extent, different people for, for the jobs, but you will, still, you will still need it. If you don't do that, then I'm afraid you will risk um, being uh, out of business uh, relatively quickly um, because simply your clients will not want to deal with you. And it's much more about than just having some sexy applications where you can do payments fast or, or trade your stock uh, cheaply. That's, that's for granted. But, it's, it, but I mean, it's the, the overall provision of, uh, of financial services and advice that you have to put on a new, on a new footing. And um, it was also, I mean, maybe before I stop here, um, it um, was one of the reasons when I... Um, when I thought about the development of our board of directors going forward that I have asked um, uh, Professor Sebastian Troon, who is the, was the founder of mm -hmm. Google X, the mm -hmm. research laboratory. He's actually the guy who invented the car that drives us out the driver, <laughs> um, among other things. Uh, I asked him to join our board, not because I want to uh, build a bank that drives without bankers, but because I, I wanted the bank to... Without bankers, that was the clear <laughs> kind of imagery there. I, I knew you would careful. say that. Uh, <laughs> No, but because I, I, I had long discussions with him from the early, uh, early, early moment on, I, I first spoke to him about 
what will future customers or clients want from us and how can we address those needs in a way that is uh, that basically answers those those demands in a way that they feel happy satisfied and they think that you know for the service they get they are prepared and happy to pay us a fee mm -hmm. that's one of the uh, one of the things and that's in, in 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 my opinion in the end that's the most fundamental and basic mm. basic uh, issue you have to deal with it on the good side on the opportunity side and that's really the last thing i say is if you get that right if you get the model right it's obviously then much easier to basically transport that into other markets and to grow market shares and maybe even to develop new markets in other areas that otherwise you would not have been able to do because you would have to build 350 branches first uh, or whatever. I think that's the upside potential. And uh, mm. as, as you know, bankers sometimes also are optimists despite all the bad news you, you hear every day. That's basically the way I think we should steer the industry. And mm. that's certainly the way I will try to steer mm. our company too. Mm. So that's for, by way of introduction. That's great. That's great. Thank you very much. Let me come in. Um, so I'm going to make a brief kind of comment and, and pose a question then or is this going to continue? So I think you've been really helpful in outlining for us uh, a number of conventional understandings of threats to banking. I think you've also made a strong claim about trust being at the heart of contemporary banking and the future of banking, really managing both institutional and personal trust. And I guess the, you know, if this were a regular classroom and you made this analysis, as my students know, I'd now say, okay, that's really interesting. Okay, what are you going to do about that, <laughs> right? So it'd be lovely to hear from you a little bit about what you see as next steps or how you think, you know, you're going to move from the current position you have. What you're, how you're going to learn, how are you going to do some of these things? I'd say just by give you a minute to think about that. I'd say, you know, in, in the comments that are made, I, I think of things like. Uh, people think about mobile money, uh, about the kind of transformations in the, the notion of non-fiat currencies. I think over a longer time, the lessons that might have come from, so in a sense I'm going to say, what are lessons you can learn from 20 years of changes in the financial service industry? So think about mobile money and uh, electronic banking, electronic wallets. wallets. I'm interested in things like over the last 30 years, uh, financial markets and stock exchanges in particular were transformed. Um, so what can we learn from those transformations? I think another issue you mentioned on reputation trust, many platforms say that we all use have ways to electronically, digitally measure and accumulate trust and, trust and credibility. So I'm curious what, we, what you think banking can learn from many of these, let's call them experiments, and if, what's the way forward from your perspective, if that's not too direct? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's not too direct. No, I mean, first of all, I think what, what, what you rightly point out is we have to learn from that. And I don't, I don't think anybody could claim he has a silver right. bullet. Yeah. Uh, at least otherwise, you banks, some of the banks would probably look differently already. Um, so we have to test things. There are a couple of elements that you can do. I think the interaction between the bank and the client, not on an individual basis, but on a larger scale, yeah, it has to be intensified significantly. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. if you go on Amazon uh, and you do some, they have immediate feedback on, on customer satisfaction, on, on what clients want, mm -hmm. what is good, what is not so good. One element that you can do. I think big data will help a lot in finding out much better what clients really want as opposed to what we think they want. Um, that will be another element that will help. And if you, if, you are, if you get to a position where you basically address these issues maybe even before, uh, a client would, uh, would ask you for it over time. It will, will obviously help you strengthen the relationship that you mm -hmm. have uh, with, the ba with, with banks. Uh, the, third, the third area where I think we can do more and learn more is, the and that is basically the result of 30 years of banking regulation and mm -hmm. regulation and regulation. Uh, I think there are smart ways to educate clients to get them to a higher level of understanding and know-how of the financial service industry. So I'm, for instance, I, you know, I'm thinking about can we use or apply some almost gaming applications or the educational applications to bring clients to a higher level in terms of risk awareness, in terms of what products look like and can we then that, use that then in terms of how we deal with them going forward in the future. I think that's a, that's a big a big, uh, would be a big step forward also the clients themselves can understand mm -hmm. better and test better. And I think that, will, mm -hmm. that would uh, increase reliability mm -hmm. and, and ultimately also strengthen trust 
uh, mm -hmm. in the industry. But and then mm -hmm. fourthly, I would say generally in the area of, of risk management and in the area of, uh, of controls, the digitization will play a very significant role. A lot of what you have to do ha handily at the moment. I mean, uh, you may have a thousand credit risk management people. I think I'm relatively certain that over time you can do a lot of credit risk management with so very sophisticated tools and applications with significantly less people, but certainly as good as you do it if you do it just manually, uh, basically, uh, uh, every day. All those things combined together. We have to try them out. Some of them will work. Yeah. I'm sure that some of the applications or some of the ideas we have may not work, but then you have to change it. But you will have to increase and intensify the feedback loop, loop mm -hmm. much faster, mm -hmm. and you will be able to do it in this mm -hmm. environment mm -hmm. as opposed to the past. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. It's really helpful. Should we go one more round? Or are sure. You? Yeah. So let me ask you a question that's a little bit off the original conversation we've had, but I think really falls what you're saying. One of the core lessons for people who study innovation is that typically incremental innovations happen within the familiarity of the industry and that more transformational or discontinuous uh, innovations come from unexpected locations. Given you know you have a number of years of experience, you've had, as Kathy said, you've worked in a number of kinds of locations. What are the industries that banking could learn from given the last 20 years of transformations in many industries, right? So if we step away from financial services, and, and again, this is, a high, this, is a, this is a classroom question, right? It's a hypothetical question. Where could banking learn from that isn't obvious to most of us today? If you can help us think about that for a minute. Well, I think about the way you treat, uh, you treat your customers or you deal with your class, uh, uh, customers or trying to understand your customers. I think we, we certainly can learn a lot from what Silicon Valley has produced mm. over, over, the, over the last mm. couple of years. When you, see, when you look at the transformation of Apple, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, over, over the many years, I think it's a, it's a, clearly that's something to be learned from that. Uh, I would say it, you would also see it in, 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 in other industries that you know, the, 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 the ultimate focus on, on your clients and, the, and, and, and to find a way to make this easy uh, mm -hmm. fast, for instance, Uber is a, for me is a very good example mm -hmm. of somebody who has mm -hmm. focused on something which was fairly narrow mm -hmm. in a way, right? But optimized mm -hmm. it in a way mm -hmm. so that uh, that you know you as a as a customer or, mm -hmm. or feel you're being understood. You get mm -hmm. the service you mm -hmm. want, you have the quality you want, mm -hmm. you got yeah, you want, and you get basically then ultimately that kind of trust. I mean, I use use it from time to time mm -hmm. because I think, well, I get a good driver, I get a good mm -hmm. car, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a, I can Fast even, convenient. every time I can, uh, I can basically give my rating on, on the service mm -hmm. that I got. Mm -hmm. We have to get to, to, mm -hmm. to I'm not question. suggesting every time you talk to your relationship manager, you give them a rating, yeah, no, but no, yeah. you may do similar things or comparable things. And that's, I think, the, that mm -hmm. focus on, on, on the ultimate, on the ultimate needs and, the, and, mm -hmm. and requirements of the mm -hmm. clients. That's something which we can learn mm -hmm. a lot from, I would say, the Silicon, Silicon mm -hmm. Valley companies. That's interesting. That's great. Uh, you've been very kind. Let me, let me open it up to other people too, but you've been really kind. I think uh, Urs has been very kind to give us a glimpse of both his own vision and also a kind of a quick history of some of the ways that Credit Suisse and others are, what, they're, what you're noticing in a sense and where we go from there. I think the you know, last comment he made about Uber, I think is really important. One of the things we know, again, we study innovation, is that a lot of innovation is unloosening or, or loosening what are now conventions that make things seem necessary or inevitable and unloosening those conventions and then reimagining what's possible. And all of us are customers of banking, whether at the check, you know, as a, as a retail customer or in private wealth or whatever area. So we all have firsthand experience of banking. I'm happy to have entertain some questions, sure, if that's absolutely, all right, absolutely. from people either, you know, to what we said tonight, to what we haven't said yet, to what we might want to think about. And if you want to give him advice, we'll take advice as well, right? So, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead, John. So I'm going to cite China as an example, but I don't really want you to talk about China. I hope that you can apply this um, set of questions to perhaps another nation or area that you know better. Um, so in China, we've seen 40% uh, of the, the total banking market switch over to the non-bank banks in eight years. Mm -hmm. And again, looking at China, you have different parts of the crowdfunding movement, you refer to crowdfunding, that are growing 100 to 200% a year, and we're now measuring crowdfunding in the billions. So if, if those kinds of rates in China 
end up being what we see in crowdfunding across the world. There, there's some interesting questions there about disruption as well as in that non-bank banking. So if you could just take the words non-bank banking and apply them to a different market, maybe talk about crowdfunding for a minute, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, first of all, let me just say something on, on the China development. And, and what it shows also is that um, um, sometimes, you know, you're influenced by external external boundaries in a way, right? Uh, the, the success of what you described in China and, and you know, I could cite another example, money market funds. The, la the largest money market fund now is basically Alibaba's mm -hmm. uh, money market fund that is basically the result of all the credit balances of their, of their customers that they pool and then move it into, in, into money market fund. They pay higher interest rates than you would get in China uh, from banks because they are, thank France. you very much, yeah. because they are, as you know, there is an upper limit for that. And that has created a huge money market fund. I mean, I think by now it's 90 billion, about 90 billion dollars, by far the largest I think you will find. Uh, that's, you can see what, you know, the potential. And that's, that's an area that I hadn't addressed before. I mean, it's, it, it's either crowd, the crowdfunding or the other ways of, of, let's say, pooling funds that you get through other activities. And that's an area where I would think that banks will come under attack in a way, I mean, you know, you know that bankers very often complain about regulations and that some of the regulation is really difficult and complex and hard to do and, and so forth. But in a way, so far, um, <coughs> regulation has also been a deterrent from, from extraneous entrance into, mm. into the field, at least for the, in the, into the regulated space. Now, I'm relatively certain that those boundaries will, will uh, become a bit more uh, shaky o over time and, and as, you, as you have seen uh, in, in the crowdfunding space so far we have seen significant increases not just in China we see it in, in, we see it in other countries too we see it in Western European countries we see it in, um, in India in the, in the, we have seen it in the microfinance space there uh, we see it in the, in the US lending club was a concept that was started like this it's now a book of I think 30 billion that's large but still, given the overall size of the markets, I think it's probably too early to say that you know credit will now move completely into into those areas. But I would say what Alibaba did to to the money market fund uh, conceptually could could be done by other companies too outside of China and will happen. I'm I'm, I'm relatively certain about that. The biggest impediment for at the moment for that is regulation and cross border. Uh, constraints that you have to, to offer services across the globe. But in a truly, I would say, globalized world without any regulatory boundaries, that would happen and would happen very fast, I think. Sorry, I had one uh, comment. But in China, you have like less financial product invested in, so why they will not buy into this product? So much funding and flow in. But in the actually developed world, you have loads of like, financial products you can actually invest. So, do you think that can be a good market in the developed market? Yeah. Well I, I think you know you could argue that maybe you have too many different financial products. So I mean one of the opportunities will be, and technology may help you in that, is basically that you have a better selection process of what you really want. Now China doesn't have that problem. It has other it has other issues and that's, that's why it's so yeah, successful. I would say yeah, yeah. China in a way is a is a is a separate or a special case for that. But it's a, it's a good case to illustrate what one could do uh, in, in sort of the non-banking financial services activities. And that's, I, would, say, I, I would, would, be, would be absolutely certain that this will happen in other countries too. And I don't think it will fundamentally change in China, even if China opens up more and would, uh, you would have a, a bigger collection of uh, financial uh, instruments. Too. Other questions, please? Yeah, you know, I should have asked people to introduce themselves too. So John, maybe just say quickly your name and who you are. John Hoffmeyer, I teach here and I run the Impact Bond Fund. Thanks very much. And also for you, please uh, just, Rick sorry, for Rick goes just to have, <laughs> sorry, just. Oh, please, I just, uh, just uh, uh, yeah, yes, to here. Okay. Yeah. So go ahead, Rick, sorry. Yeah, um, um, you talked about um, retail banking. Uh, investment banking has been sort of a small select club, to be like, uh, for many years. Uh, so can you see any disruptive innovation in investment banking, and also joining the room, I wanted to ask, is, is impact investing something that, uh, that banks of your size will look, look seriously in the future? Well, that, that 
to, 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 to completely to, dramatically to, to, different to, to questions. Different. Yeah. Now, on, if you talk about investment banking, you have to first define what you mean by that. Is it is it the advisory piece of investment banking? Mm -hmm. Is it the trading piece? Is it uh, credit, leverage finance, and whatever? Some areas you will see disruption. In I would say in the, in the core advisory piece, it's probably a bit more difficult to to assume because that's clearly something which in the end you want to speak to your specialist bank, but maybe the way you do that may be completely differently than it was before. I do not envisage uh, that you see investment bankers with traveling the world with their briefcases necessarily. There may be smarter ways to have a constant dialogue yeah. with your clients and by using technology and other applications. So that, that you will see. In, 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 other, in other parts of it, in the credit space, I mean, they are as affected as, as anybody, as, as the commercial or the retail, the retail space, I would say. In trading, it's different. In trading, I mean, we probably move more towards a world where you will have 24-hour trading opportunities across the globe. Um, and, uh, and, and there, I think, banks will have their, their, their piece. But, but uh, a lot of the activities there, like pure execution, will not be the really value, the high-value creation activities of banks going forward, I would say. Yeah. And then the other piece was the impact in, impact investing. Yeah. Yes, impact investing has become uh, more and more interesting and important also for banks, be it in sustainability, sustainability funds, or otherwise. What, you, what we see as a trend is that more and more clients actually want their monies or part of their monies invested in a, in, in, in a meaningful way for causes that they like. And therefore, you know, impact... Uh, uh, impact investing will become more and more important and you will see more and more of these kind of funds. Um, what you, that's, I mean, relatively certain. You see it in, you see it in, we have, we had funds for women causes, for instance, we had funds, microfinance funds, uh, and other, other kinds of, um, of, of, uh, of sustainability related funds. And they grow, uh, I would say, over proportionally at the moment, yes. I mean, they're always, in the end, you have to be able to demonstrate that uh, you know, so the, the, the expected returns actually uh, are met. And, but I must say the track record of many of those is actually, is actually quite, is very good. It's very good so far. Yeah, please go ahead and just introduce yourself, if you will. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so I'm uh, Linus Spieler, executive MBA student. And um, suggestions are allowed, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so how many... Um, I think it's great that you have an, an autonomous car inventor on your board, etc. But if you're interested in knowing what the customer of tomorrow is interested in, um, you should offer a seat to a young MBA student. <laughs> <laughs> is that an application or? Actual. But someone, I mean, yeah, I think, I mean, why not take some young, smart people that that's not, not the customer of today, but the customer of tomorrow. Well, you may not believe it, but we have a lot of, uh, a lot of young, smart people in our company, and actually we hire to, uh, a couple of hundred every, every year out of graduate schools and out of undergraduate schools. I, I think uh, a lot of, um, of big institutions don't do that. Well, it's great if you do that, because that's... Um, no, interestingly enough, and you know, I'm not, not divulging any, any, uh, too, too many secrets, but when we did the Future Lab project, you know, when we actually looked at it, we intentionally selected a group of young people from our organization across the globe, from Switzerland, from Asia, from the United States, mm. but not the senior people. Uh, they came in later then to assess some of the ideas, but I mean, to, to produce the ideas and the thinking, we intentionally didn't do that with, uh, with uh, so let's say, more senior, older people and with gray hair like me. But now that I think about it, it is, it is an application. <laughs> okay. Okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah. For what? <laughs> no. What were you saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit the tougher question. You know, the the, the thing with board seats is it's um, it's it's more than than defining the the customer of the future. Yeah. You have to do a lot of supervisory and control work that maybe you enjoy a bit less than than <laughs> coming up with new ideas. Uh, that, um, but uh, I will keep it in mind. Mm -hmm. If I have a shortage, I'll, 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 I'll get back. Um, I, I have a question. I'm a Wellington Holbrook. I'm a, I'm a student here as well. Um, I'm curious to, you know, so you described the ecosystem of a lot of young fintech incubators and small businesses coming up. 
Um, and that potential risk. What about the risk of the financially wealthy old organizations like Apple and Google and so on, who are, short, who are potentially considering more and more moves into the financial space? Interesting. I mean, the, that's a very good question, actually. The even better question is why haven't they done it mm. yet? Because it can't be a question of money, right? It can't be a question of technological know how. Google or Apple, for that matter, could do that relatively easily, and some of them have actually a banking license. I think Facebook has a bank banking license, Apple may have one too. But they have never gone into the core of the, of the regulated banking activities, and I think there is a reason for that. I don't think that you know, those companies necessarily want to go into the regulated sphere. I think that what they strategically do, I, I don't know it, for, but what I assume they do is they look at the value chain of the services that the banking industry provides, and they will see what can we do successfully, maybe better, with, um, uh, with good margins, without having to undergo the whole, the whole scrutiny uh, of, the, of the, let's say, the regulated world of banking. And that's what I think you will see more and more also going forward. But, um, but it's, there's no question that you know, any of those companies, they could open a bank and they could say, well, let's look as to how the banking of the future would look like. Now, it, will, it's, it behooves us as incumbents to make sure that you know, we are you know, uh, as far advanced with our own offerings that we are, that's actually not so easy to do it. But quite frankly, I think the main, reason, the main reason is that I think they haven't done it because it's still a bit further away from the original activities. The other reason is if you take a company like Google, for instance, they know a lot about their clients which they know from the normal current business model. And there is an issue of, mm. I would say, trust, maybe even almost like conflict of interest if you apply that knowledge that you have from other activities into the provision of banking services, into risk management structures and so forth. I think that's the other reason why they may be a bit hesitant to actually go in uh, a full, full uh, speed. But there's no question they could. I mean, they have, they have the ingredients, technical know-how and the money to do it. Yes, hi, my name is Jessica. I'm an MBA student here, and I was wondering with the increase in activity uh, with mobile banking, a lot of banks in the U.S. at least are having issues engaging their customer on the front end and creating that loyalty. So you sort of mentioned creating an electronic community and a feedback loop, but how would you envision sort of increasing that uh, relationship when you no longer have as many face-to-face interactions to cross our products or to build that loyalty up front? I mean, it's, one of the, it's basically one of the most fundamental, most difficult questions to answer. We try to do it now as part of the, of, of the way we, we, we create our digital private bank. Um, it's, in fairness, it's not easy to do it. It's not easy to do it. It's, well, it's the, in the, and I would say it's the ultimate litmus test. If you don't get that done, then the risk of not keeping clients or having bigger turnovers or losing clients mm -hmm. or having clients just for one Thing and then and then losing him again will will uh, significantly increase. There's no there's no one way to do it. I think it's a combination of various factors that you have to be able to to provide an offering that he finds attractive. But it's very important that at all times uh, a client has the possibility of a direct interaction with somebody at the bank. I think I think that's vitally important. I would want it at least uh, as a client, and I'm pretty certain most clients uh, would want to have it too. Um, that is, uh, what you can do and what you can consider is that you, yeah, that you even create special um, uh, uh, environments or special uh, social, social media groups um, among clients or with particular uh, you know, people with particular interest in certain fields that you could do in a, in a sort of semi-controlled way within your, within your uh, environment. That's something which I think is... Uh, uh, could be quite an interesting approach. So I'm not calling it the Facebook for the banking clients or so, but something akin to that. Uh, some of the elements that are used there could be something which be, which might be a, you might be able to strengthen relationship with uh, with clients going forward. You have to do that. If you don't, if you lose your client and the live relationship to your client, it will have a negative impact on your business, and that can be quite severe. Yes. Thank you. My name is Jonathan. I'm uh, SDA China India Relations here at Oxford. Um, I'm curious, you're on the board of um, uh, the advisory board in, in, on financial institutions in Moscow and, and Beijing as well. 
And I'm curious what you think of something like the Chinese sort of, you know, expected to be Chinese-led BRICS bank, things like that. And this isn't quite financial innovation, though perhaps it could be. Like, what sort of effect do you think a BRICS bank or anything like that would have on, you know, global financial markets or the international monetary system? Well, some of them play a fairly big role already and may, may play an even bigger As I said, some of, the, uh, some of the banks that are very large, I mean, Chinese banks, if you look at the top 10 banks in the world, I don't know, six of them are Chinese banks, probably, after, when you just look at the balance sheet size. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, those, if, if those banks would, um, would actually go global, if they really wanted to and would mm -hmm. try to sort of do that, they will play a very significant role. Uh, in those countries, and that, that's basically possible for many of the banks in Russia, obviously at the moment is a bit uh, in a different situation uh, for obvious reasons, um, but you know, you have banks that have grown out of those countries that have become very large. I mean, take Brazil as, a, as an example, there are some Brazilian banks that have become extremely big uh, and uh, are, are basically uh, successful way above their own their home territory. That's so uh, I would say in a global in a global financial services world that's doable. The problem is again I would say that sometimes it's not so easy to to get past those uh, regulatory hurdles that you still have for certain mm -hmm. markets, be it the EU, be it in the US mm -hmm. um, uh, and so forth. So you have to have the proper licenses, the regulatory environment has to be such that you can actually do your business and that is something which puts up an obstacle that you have to overcome. And that's sometimes harder for <coughs> banks that come from countries where there's not a long tradition of reciprocity and uh, acknowledgement of, of, of uh, regulatory environments and the like. But uh, that's a trend you will see. I mean, you look at, look at the development of Chinese banks over the last 10 years. Yeah. Go ahead, please. I'm an undergrad studying economics and management now. In light of the HSB, Fiasco. Do banks need to change? If so, what do they need to change? Or is everything fine? Well, <laughs> that's <laughs> everything's fine. Next question. Questions for whom? Is it time? Now, I always, you would not expect me to comment on the HSBC uh, matter. <laughs> the only thing I would say, the way I read it in the newspapers, most of the allegations stem from a time before 2008. Now, did banks have to change since then? Yes, they did have. Did they change? I think many of the banks, most of the banks, have significantly changed in many respects, um, be it in terms of business model, be it in terms of controls, be it in terms of mm -hmm. compliance standards. But the world has also changed too, right? I mean, a lot of, I mean, standards that um, you to society today expects from banks are different than they probably have been 20 years ago or 10 years ago. There is a tough, uh, I would say, adjustment process for that. In the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, banks had to do a lot of changes to fix capital shortcomings, other things. We have seen, we have seen wrong incentive steerings. We have seen compensation systems that went berserk that you had to change to adjust to, to, to actually align uh, uh, employees at the bank with, uh, with clients and a lot has happened. The trouble is this is a fairly long period of transition that you have to do and any time or every time something comes up and even if it's from the past the public at large and rightfully so I would say says well doesn't it ever change? I mean the biggest if I had one wish for our sector is get it done and make sure that you know from now on things are, are running smoothly and hope that you don't get caught with something legacy item from the past. It's a very hard transition, but the only thing I would say for the industry is that the industry has changed more than people at large would generally believe they have. The, the, the changes that have gone through that industry are fundamental, I would say, in almost every respect. Now, does that mean that nothing can go wrong? No. In an industry with 100, 100 millions of people who work there, you will always have something that can go wrong. But the most basic and most fundamental mistakes or, or shortcomings of the industry have been addressed, be it through regulators, be it through banks themselves. And I can tell you if there's one thing that, as a chairman of the bank, look extremely carefully, um, is that you know, we do not run into these kind of issues. Why? Because apart from all the other things, because it's, it's wrong, it's not right to do it, the reputational damage that you create to an institution and therefore also the economic damage 
that, uh, that results from that is enormous. And as I said before, we have talked about trust. I mean, the best way to undermine trust is exactly if things like these happen. That's not what you want. That's not what you want. But that's a, it, it is a transition, uh, transition phase, and there may be things coming up, or have been coming up, that have to be resolved. A lot of it has, been, has gone through the system. Banks have also paid a lot for that, uh, be it in the US, be it in other countries. Mm -hmm. But um, I think you know, probably the honest truth is mm. there, may, there may always be some things that could come up somewhere that will have a negative impact. And once an industry is so much on the radar screen as banks are, it doesn't need a lot, you know, to reinforce your bias that, you know, things do not change. And that's the biggest problem. You have to get out of the headlines if you could do that. And the only thing to do mm. it is that quarter by quarter and year after year, you, you basically demonstrate that you run a proper business, you run it properly, that, you know, you're, you have the right uh, business ethics and the right culture in the firm. If you do that over time, things will change, but it will not mm. be overnight. It will be mm. over time. We have just time for a few more questions, so let me do this if I may. I'm going to ask people sure. just to post their questions, three or four, and then you have a yes. chance to react yes. to the ensemble. So, Chajin, you have a question still? And you have a question? And Andre, and you have a question? Okay, so we're going to do f four for now and see where we get. So, quick questions, he'll make <coughs> quick answers. I'd like to just do them in, in a row, and he's okay. going to collect whatever he wants to answer and <laughs> answer it. Okay, um, I'm Chajin, I'm an MBA student. My background is in technology. I was wondering, in banks, do you have actually a division that focuses on innovation? Okay, so let's, uh, that's good. So do you have a, do you have a focus here on innovation? Yeah, yeah, I was wondering if banks actually focus on innovation, if there's a division that actually focuses on innovation. Uh, there's not a, oh, can I answer that right away? Yeah, sure. No, there's okay. not a division on innovation, but what we have, we have a special, I would say a special unit outside that deals with, that deals with that aspect that I discussed about the digital private bank, which is basically innovation tool. And we have within our strategy department, we, we have a, I mean, we have a subgroup that deals with in, in way, innovation, innovation trends, and we have an innovation board also at the company. But it's fair to say that is of recent that, uh, that we have that. Typically, we did not have an innovation division as such that was run as a division. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Marco Vena. I'm a student your private banking operates in a premium sector, and a couple of these pillars that you have are usually personal contact, and another one that in the past at least was exclusive access to certain investments. Another question is with the commoditization of investment on the one hand side, and maybe the personal contact being less important in the future, how do you set yourself apart from the retail sector? Well, how do you raise the premium? Yeah. What you will find is that some, the more sophisticated clients are, the more sophisticated financial issues or problems mm -hmm. they have. And for that, you will always need to do more than commoditized products. But there is a segment where I think commoditization of products will play a role. And then I think the, the, I would say the added value of a bank in that segment is that you, know, you are good at picking the right products or the right strategy for a client tailored to what he really needs. That will be, even in a commoditized world, this will be essential. And basically, it's the asset allocation and then the, the precise proposal of what you want mm. to do. And that's still something which, even in, in, a, in a fully digitized world, will be important. I think it will be, probably even be more important. I'm sorry, just to follow up, but it's offered by retail banks nowadays, right? And I just push a button and I all of a sudden the Skype, I have a Skype conference with my uh, oh, yeah. uh, consultant. So, so in a way, the question, look, ultimately it's a question of the quality of the, of the advice you're getting and, and of, the, of the, I would say, the particulars of, 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 of the service. And I'm, I'm absolutely certain that, you know, by the push of the, I can give you a model portfolio that you can take out of the internet in, in, in 10 seconds. And you may do it and you may be very happy about it, but maybe it's not what you really want or what you really need. You want to discuss something with, it, with somebody who understands what you need, so who knows you. Who knows what, oh, he wants to buy a house. Oh, he has two kids, don't have to go through private school. So maybe that's my mm. investment horizon is like this. And it will, that will drive maybe some of the decisions in a slightly different fashion than just pull up a, uh, mm. a model portfolio. Andre, last question. All the way back, sorry, I'm sorry, I heard to you, yeah. Yes. 
Um, no, picture, yeah. Mesa, okay. okay. Uh, just to follow on on the HSBC uh, comment, I was going to ask about um, the anti bank anti banking lobby that seems to be prevalent at the minute for the last six or seven years. And would you say that as a board, you are now more internally focused and not so much looking out of the window? What do you mean by looking out the window? At, at the customer, as you were talking about earlier, at, the f at what oh. future customers oh, would expect okay. banking to look like. I think one of the big problems that the banking industry has had in the last couple of years is indeed that they had to focus so much and do so much introspective work in order to change processes, procedures, build out uh, compliance departments uh, and so forth that I would say they probably did not spend enough time on focusing on, on, on developing clients' needs. Uh, and, and maybe even, even their, their, their growth strategies. That's what you, what you see in, in many respects. Yes, that's true. But do you see it changing at all? Yes. Or is the apology honeymoon uh, coming to an end, do you think? Or do you see it's, it? not an it's not an apology honeymoon. I wouldn't call it a honeymoon in the first place. Like, uh, my, my, my understanding of a honeymoon is something different. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> we may have different standards. Um, but um, but um, yeah. I hope. I hope we'll be in a situation where we do not have to uh, apologize so much for things that went wrong in the past and can focus um, uh, on, on new things. I mean, I've, I said it in, in, in town halls at my company, said, look, we now have to shift gears and we have to move forward to actually grow our company and come up with a, a strategy as to how we want to develop uh, the great businesses that we have. And that is something which clearly, when you have to constantly fight to reduce costs, to, to make your, your business more efficient in times where margins come down, where interest rates come down. That's a, that's a hard thing to do and it needs a, it's a mind change actually. And mm. You can only do it probably successfully mm. if you can put the other things you know, to, to an end and say, well, we have, we have dealt with the legacy issues, We've, we know what, what went wrong, we have, we have fixed it and now we can move on. That's, that, you're absolutely right in your analysis. That's great. So I want to, I need to bring to a close a little bit, I'm sorry, but let me give you a different ending challenge. I'm going to ask Burst to give us a few, two minutes of his reflections on the conversation and also in a sense to pose what he thinks the questions are you should have asked him, right? So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to, to both, you know, we, you've, had a, you've been very kind and responsive. So a couple minutes to close any thoughts you'd like to share and maybe also push back on a couple of questions that you think would be interesting. So we've heard a lot of different ideas here. We started out with a lot of work on talk on customers, and we've moved to some other parts of the value system. We had some provocative questions. We had some questions that were really opening up the different fates and futures of banking. And then we've talked the last few questions really about the, the, the quality, the, again, the issues of trust and reputation and, and probity that were at the heart of Urs's comments earlier. And so how that's really going to be a distinguishing part of the thing. So again, a couple to share parting thoughts, yeah. but also challenge us a little well, bit. Well, I, I wouldn't push back too much on questions. Some of the questions were very good and very justified. Um, I even got an, an, an application I didn't expect, but that's all fine. <laughs> uh, <coughs> No, I think that, I mean, you, 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 uh, I think you asked the right questions. And it was clear to me that if, as a banker, you, you go to London or near London to Oxford these days, you would get the question of HSBC. That was clear. That's what I expected. But it's a good, it was, for me, it was a very good question to actually deal with the question of, of, of corporate culture and how you can actually move that and change that over time and why it's ne necessary to do it because otherwise you, you may actually uh, undermine the credibility ultimately of an institution and therefore also its economical uh, success. Um, there, there's not much I would want to say on, on top of, of what I have been, been saying. Um, I think you were very nice and kind. Actually, normally I got much nastier <laughs> questions. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I think the question I expected from you that you didn't ask me, if I may say that, and was Please, why do you still why, why are you still in that industry with a lot of all these uh, issues and, and problems from the past? I say, I think because I think it's a fascinating industry. And it's an industry which is, in my opinion, is at an inflection point where you can do a lot to move ahead. Actually, there are a lot of opportunities to grow in that industry, even in difficult uh, economic circumstances. But, um, and that's what I think is, is, the, is the, real, the real sort of challenge that motivates you to, to, to run, run the bank. I think the financial yeah. service industry, and I have to make some propaganda, is an intellectually stimulating industry and has been for a long time. A lot has changed. Even compensation 
have, has changed and systems have changed. Um, but if you want to do that, I think you can do a lot of good also to society in that industry. Extension of credit uh, is an important uh, and noble task that you have to do mm. to society. If you don't believe me, just look as to what is going on in the Eurozone at the moment. We desperately need that. We need it to stimulate growth. And if you stimulate growth, you can do away with a lot of things that are yeah. at the moment not running so smoothly, mm. high unemployment rates and other things. So I think banks can play a, a, a good role, but they have to fix the house first. But if they do that, then I think uh, this is, will be a fascinating industry. And if you get it right on the disruption side, on the technology side, then I'm, I'm relatively certain that it will also be uh, hugely economically uh, successful going forward. Great. Great. I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight and really good questions. And please join me in thanking Urs Rohner for an extremely candid <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>